Hello, my name is Heath Jones, and I'm the pastor of Northwood Christian Church, and if you'd like, you might check out our website, which is www.indyncc.org, that's www.ndncc.org, and at our site, you can learn more about our church and our ministries, our worship times, and our values and ways that you can become involved. In the meantime, we're going to be going over a parable that Jesus told as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, and the story goes. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared... Whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Some of you have heard me talk about my time working at a corn mill. I've shared several stories from my time there, a couple of years. It was years ago, in fact, when I had just started out in the ministry. My wife was finishing college, and I was working part-time at my first church, and we needed some real income. Uh, so, enter the corn mill. A good job for, for which I was grateful. In fact, just this past week, I went back to that town, and I drove onto the property, and I visited this place that I had worked a decade ago. But I only mention it because all of this talk about grain bins has me reminiscing. And I've included a picture here about the sort of thing that I'm talking about when I say grain bins or the sort of atmosphere like I experienced at that mill. And you've seen bins like these all over the countryside. And one may assume that they're full of grain. But if they are, we might have a problem. And what could be that problem? The problem is this. If you leave the grain in the bin for too long, it will begin to turn. First sour and then rank and rotten. And sometimes at that corn mill, it was my job to inspect the corn on the receiving end. A farmer would bring in a truckload of corn to sell to the mill. But first, I had to make sure that the farmer hadn't let his grain sit too long in his own bins. And you could sometimes tell right away by the smell. The corn would take on a distinct smell when it was starting to turn that I came to identify pretty well over the course of time. But even if the corn looked fine, it might have that smell and it might not pass the smell test and we would have to reject the truck. But if it passed the smell test, I would then run another series of tests, lab tests uh, to test for molds or other toxins. And then I'd look carefully for signs of bug infestation. And if it was determined that the grain was fine, we unloaded it into our bins. But if we determined that the load was a bad load, I had to reject the truck and send it on its way. And it was a real shame to reject a truck because what we all knew, the farmer and those of us working at the corn mill alike, was that this signified a loss of resources and a significant waste. If the corn was very bad, the farmer had nothing to do but sometimes to throw it out if it was that bad. And if they were maybe luckier, maybe just a little bad, the corn still might serve as feed corn for animals or last last chance, maybe it might be used to produce ethanol. But whatever the case, no one wanted to see this precious resource that they had worked so hard to cultivate 
to go to waste. The farmer's labor is all for nothing. But once the grain had been accepted and brought into our facility, then it became our job to ensure that the grain did not rot in our bins. And we had many, many bins, huge grain bins. This was an operation that milled corn for corn muffin mix, snacks, for flour, and many other home products that we all enjoy. But we knew that it would never become nourishing food by just sitting in our bins. So it was then our job to keep it flowing, and that's what we did. We milled the corn to our customer specifications and shipped it out just as fast as we could because what we all knew was that if we didn't move the grain out through the mill, it would surely become a rotten mess and no good for anybody. So to ensure that this did not happen, it was sometimes my job to clean the corn bins. I was the grunt. I was lowest on in the hierarchy. And so they would lower me down from the top of the bin in a harness. I would just be dangling there and they'd lower me down with this long wand that blew out pressurized air. And with that air, I'd blast away moldy, rotting corn from the sides of the bin to keep these rotten pieces from turning future payloads of corn into rotting grain. But all things considered... The rule of thumb was always, don't let it spoil. Keep the corn moving, moving from one place to the next, and eventually ending up in someone's home. Food to eat and enjoy. A blessing to the human race. We were preparing blessings for the human race at that mill. And I learned a lot while working at the corn mill. And I don't think I'd ever have understood the importance of keeping grain moving to places where it can do some good. I never gave much thought to grain rotting in bins. But Jesus' audience, on the other hand, would have understood this quite well. They would have better understood Jesus' anger at the thought that a person might hoard grain, thus condemning potential food to the trash heap, thus condemning many in the community to struggle to find adequate food or perhaps even starve. Today's conversation in, in the text in Luke chapter 12 begins with a question about inheritance, how to divide it between siblings. One brother asks Jesus to confront a greedy sibling who will not divide their father's inheritance. And Jesus does not arbitrate arbitrate between the brothers. But instead, he moves the conversation out to a bird's eye view and addresses the heart of such squabbles about material goods. He decides to strike at the heart of the issue between these brothers, which was greed. It is here where he drops that iconic line, take care, exclamation point, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Those words, take care, carry with them a sense of warning and foreboding. In the original language, the sense of urgency is such that you would shout similar words at someone who is about to step out into traffic. Watch out! And what we today call materialism is so devastating to a person in a community that we should be as wary of it as we would be of a deadly snake or a treacherous person. But we've become so used to thinking that our lives do consist in the abundance of possessions that this warning can come off as a bit much, maybe a bit too dire. I mean, really, does it all matter that much what we do with our grain when we have too much of it? Well, yes. And the reasons are laid plain in this parable. The end result of greed, says Jesus, is devastating. Its impact on the community is most obvious. Here is a man who has created so much food that he doesn't even know what to do with it. Bigger barns is his answer. Many would think a sensible answer to the problem. What Jesus' audience knows is that there is no way 
that this man will be able to consume all that grain before it rots in the bins. The rich man can build bigger barns, but if what is contained in those bins is not soon consumed, what he'll end up with is bigger bins and more rotting grain, more waste. The whole while, the people in his community starve. But he can hardly notice those others in his community. And this is made plain by the language that he uses. Notice he doesn't talk to others. He doesn't converse with his servants or neighbors. He doesn't ask maybe somebody of comparable status what he should do with his excess grain. Instead, he holds down a conversation with himself. I don't know if that stuck out to you the way that it has often stuck out to me. Lines like, and I will say to my soul, soul, you know, talking to yourself in this internal dialogue that seems, I don't know, a bit, a bit strange. And this way of speaking to oneself still reads a little weird today, but less so than it would have in Jesus's time even. Of this, biblical scholar Barbara Reed writes, in such a world, the isolation of the rich man in the parable is alarming. A man of means would presumably have a family, slaves, tenants, and an extensive network of patrons and clients. He asks himself, what shall I do? I do not have space. I shall do. I shall tear down. I shall store. I shall say to myself, the focus of his reflections is my harvest, my barns, my grain, myself. And his solution is shocking. He will tear down his barns and build larger warehouses where he will stockpile his grain and other goods for many years, presumably waiting until he can charge the most exorbitant prices. The rich man has no thought of God or other people, planning to take his ease and indulge himself in food, drink, and merriment. End quote. And for th these reasons, the man is called a fool. In his isolation and with all of his grain, he is called a fool and by God. And this is the only parable that Jesus tells where God intervenes and speaks into this directly. In the others, God is a figure represented metaphorically as a father, a gardener, a king, etc. But here God steps in directly and calls the man a fool. And Jesus' audience would likely be aware of Psalm 41 verse 1, which asserts that a fool says in their heart that there is no God. Well, here the fool is addressed directly by the God he has replaced with wealth and riches. And he is called a fool because his greed has caused him to behave in foolish and emphasis on devastating ways. Devastating to the community, to be sure. He could have, as I've been saying, used the abundance of grain to bless his neighbors and friends. If he has any friends, the parable seems to indicate that he feels no connection with the others in his community. At least that never comes through in any obvious way. But he could have used the excess grain to bless those who presumably did all the work. A man of his status would have field hands and servants to do the hard labor. So he's taken all the credit. But how if he had shared the abundance with them, those that had done the hardest labor? His bumper crop could have been, could have been as a healing salve, as a medicine to the people during a time when life was very hard for the people. In fact, his very own religious texts gave specific instructions about what to do with excess grain in the fields. He already had some guidelines he could have gone by. It was written in the Torah that it was to be left in the field, to be collected by those who have no means or incomes. But no, the food would not be used to bless the community, thus prolonging, exacerbating even their suffering. The people know that this grain will be used to fill this rich man's belly, 
or it will rot in his brand new bins. But this man's greed is devastating to himself as well. Devastating to his community, for sure, to himself as well. And this comes through in the parable's telling. We've already discussed the man's isolation indicated by his dialogue with himself. Here is a man who is disconnected from his community and is no better for it. Here is the sad story of a recluse hiding away with his wealth. Every now and again, you'll hear a story like that about a person who dies in isolation, a lonely hermit, someone living up on the hill or out and away, and no one sees except they come out now and again. And then the person dies, and then in searching their house, they discover that they've been stuffing pillows and mattresses with money for years. Perhaps they were a millionaire by the time they died, and nobody knew it. And if that hermit would have shared the resources with the community, they would have been reconnected to their community in meaningful ways, but no. Not to be, so they die alone. This is one reason the rich man was a fool. His way led to isolation and loneliness, when his life may have been far fuller if he had found connection with his neighbors by way of his resources. But then there's the punchline at the end. Another reason, or given as the reason, he is named a fool. Because, we read, his life is about to be taken from him. Suddenly, that night in fact, the man discovers that when all is stripped away at the end of things, our possessions and wealth are absolutely useless to us in that moment when you are faced with your end. The man probably believed that he was building up a security against all that could harm him. But then he discovered that he was very poor in the ways that mattered most. And death found him in the end as it will for us all. And what then? What good was it? What good is it? Or as Jesus put it, starting with verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. What's the message for us here? And the message is actually quite accessible. No matter who you are, I, I think, you know, from lower middle class to very rich. I think the message is accessible no matter who you are. When you consider all that you've got, from the food in your fridge to your digital bank accounts to the junk that piles up in your basement. As I was saying, when you are thinking about these things, here's a good rule of thumb condensed by way of this parable. Don't let it spoil. Rule of thumb, don't let any of your resources rot on the vine or in the bins or in the bank accounts or anywhere in your life. We have been blessed in various ways. And those who are rich toward God, those who hold God's priorities in their hearts, know that we are called to do good things with our resources that God has blessed us with, to do what God has done with all of creation, which is to bless others by way of creation, richly and lavishly. One last word to the rich fool. Notice, we do not know what the man does in response to God's harsh rebuke and condemnation. It's possible that he repented that night and became rich towards God. and We'll never know. But the possibility is always open for each of us to become richer in the ways that matter most, to use our resources to bless others, to find ways to let our material wealth flow to the places that most need it in the world and in our community around us. And we are called to bless others as they have need. And this is the thrust of the message, especially in Luke's telling, which if you read on into its companion book, the book of Acts, contains numerous counterexamples of members in the fledgling Christian community sharing their resources, using what God has given them to bless others. And it's astonishing. And we read that nobody had a need in that place and in that time. These actions 
Furthermore, we're seen as evidence that one was rich toward God. You want to know if you are rich toward God? Look for deeds of charity and acts of generosity. That's how you'll know that you are rich in the ways that count. And what I learned in the corn mill still teaches me. You've got to keep the good grain moving. You've got to get it to the places that need it. Otherwise, it'll rot and it will be of no use to anyone. And the same is true of the good things we hold. Let what you have be a blessing to others as well. You can't keep it when you leave here. So become richer in the ways that matter most. Do you want to become rich? Then bless your friends and neighbors, even strangers, when the opportunities arise by way of your material possessions. If you do, you will be found to be rich in the ways that matter most. And isn't this what we all want? To find meaning and joy in life. So turn away from the ways of the rich fool and bless others with the good things you have been given by God. This is the way to the life we were meant for. If we can live into this way as a culture, I think our best days are still before us. If we can find it to live that way. And I really hope we can do it because The effects of greed are all around us, destroying us. And Jesus wants us to know there is a better way. Don't let what you have spoil. Choose the better way and become rich towards God.